our chief scientist and saying to you that the science is at the centre of everything we do. And I continue to say that every time I see you, so I'm saying it publicly as well. So it's my honour to chair the um, panel session that we have um, on now. And I'd like to introduce our panellists. So first of all, Professor Nerali Abram, who is from the ANU and is the chair of the National Committee on Antarctic Research. Uh, then we have Professor Stephen Chown, and we, they will be speaking in this order, so there is a, a reason for this seating pattern. Professor Stephen Chown, who's from Monash University and is the director of the SAFE program. Uh, Professor Matthew King, who's from the University of Tasmania and is the director of the Australian Centre for Excellence in Antarctic Science. And uh, Professor Nathan Brindhoff, University of Tasmania, and who is the leader of the Australian Antarctic Program Partnership. Now, our challenge is to address the topic, which is Antarctic on the Brink, Science for Societal Certainty, and to do so in a snappy nice 30 minutes and preferably leave a little bit of room for um, Q&A at the end, but we'll see how we go. So I'll hand over and welcome Nerily. Excellent. Right, thank you very much for the, the introduction. So I'm the, the chair of the National Committee for Antarctic Research. That's one of the, um, the national committees run by the Australian Academy of Science. And that committee has um, the role of representing the whole of the Antarctic science community, community in Australia. And so we do that by making sure that the membership on that committee um, has a whole range of diversity. So that includes making sure that we have membership that covers research that's happening in both the universities and in the government organisations who work in Antarctica, making sure that our membership covers different career stages um, and also addresses the different themes um, covered within the Australian Antarctic Science Strategy. It's an exciting time to be able to play a role in leading Australia's Antarctic science community. The science challenges, um, you've already heard about some of them today, um, that we are addressing, they're enormous um, and they will have huge impacts for the world. And importantly, we've seen transformations in the science funding um, and the national infrastructure that will really allow us to address these truly grand challenges with the scale of effort that can only be achieved through large and multidisciplinary campaigns and by making sure that we are bringing together the whole of the Antarctic science community. In the university sector, those transformations in funding are also allowing us to make inroads in improving diversity and breaking down barriers as we train the next generation of Antarctic scientists. Uh, through the National Committee for Antarctic Research, we also connect with the international community, including through um, the Scientific Committee for Antarctic Research. Um, and we're actually this week um, in the delegates meeting um, for SCAR. Um, I apologise if I'm a little bit weary um, for those late night meetings that are happening this week. Um, but I did want to end by just sharing um, one of the discussions that we had last night. Um, in that co international community discussing about preparations for the next international polar year. So the last polar year was in 2007. The proposal is to have the next one in um, 2032, so that will be 25 years on from the last international polar year. But the very strong message that came from the delegates last night from um, numerous nations is that we actually don't have that long to wait. We need to be making those inroads now into these important scientific questions and using that next international polar year as the destination for reporting the really important science that has to be done this de decade in Antarctica. Thank you. Stephen, yep. Uh, thank you. I'm director of securing Antarctica's environmental future or SAFE, which is a research and workforce development program funded by the Australian Research Council through its Special Research Initiatives program, headquartered at Monash, but with partners across the country, in universities, government organisations and others, and with international partners, including industry partners, such as the International Association of Antarctica Tour Operators, that's essentially the private sector travel body for 
and one of Antarctica's largest uh, activities, which is tourism that happens annually, and is now reaching, for those of, of you who don't know, numbers of about 100,000 tourists a year, is the estimate. We have three main priorities within SAFE. The first is to develop, to develop an understanding of Antarctica in the Earth system, especially to improve projections for what might be coming in the future, and how to mitigate the impacts of the change that, it's coming, that is coming, especially on biodiversity. The second of our main priorities is to foster an appreciation of Antarctica and the Southern Ocean's role in society and to ensure that the influence of these regions on Australia and elsewhere is firmly understood both by members of society and of course by the policy makers that look after the policies that are responsible for in fact keeping us safe, secure and living in a sustainable world. The third of our priorities is to convey scientific evidence to policymakers to ensure that Antarctica remains, in the words of the Protocol on Environmental Protection to the Antarctic Treaty, a natural reserve devoted to peace and science. We fit well within the Australian Antarctic program. We're complementary to the other large research programs based at universities. We have partners in the Australian Antarctic Division and we have a seven-year outlook of research that's essential. That seven-year window resonates very well with me because essentially we have about 10 to 20 years really to get on top of the problem. And by the time those 10 to 20 years are up, either we will have succeeded in getting on top of the problem or we will face the challenges that Taz van Omen and Ben galton Fenzi raised in their earlier talks today and we will have much less in the way of extremely beautiful and inspiring biodiversity in the Antarctic. Thank you. So I'm, I'm Matt King, uh, I'm the director of the uh, ARC, Australian Centre for Excellence in Antarctic Science, based out, out of the University of Tasmania, but with uh, seven university partners across Australia and um, various Australian government partners and, and about 20 um, international partners and, and we're interested in um, helping prepare uh, communities for the climate risks that will emerge from East Antarctica and the Southern Ocean. We do that by recognising that Antarctica is a, is a deeply coupled and complex system uh, that, that, that you need to understand the atmosphere, the ocean, uh, the ecosystems, the sea ice, the land ice and even the solid earth in Antarctica because they're all coupled together in very complicated ways. Uh, and so we are trying to treat uh, Antarctica as the deeply coupled and complex problem uh, that it is. Um, ACES uh, um, uh, works uh, in particularly in, in partnership with, with SAFE in areas that we uh, align, particularly Stephen's just talked about uh, some of the sea level aspects and climate aspects, um, and especially with the Australian Antarctic Program partnership, also based out of the University of Tasmania, and Nathan will speak about that in a moment. But ACES and, and AAPP um, in particular are focusing on two big problems. They're big problems in the sense that they're big scientific problems that re require scale to actually tackle, um, but they're big problems because they're societ societally important problems. Uh, and those, those two, amongst other things we're working on, uh, is about sea level, how much is sea level going to rise in the future, uh, in particular how much is Antarctica and East Antarctica going to contribute, and the role of the Southern Ocean in the climate system, either in, in in mitigating climate change uh, or exacerbating climate change. Now, Ben and Taz have already spoken about the sea level problem. Just to remind you, um, uh, in the next 80 years or so, somewhere between 0.3 and 0.9 metres of extra sea level will emerge from uh, uh, globally, uh, and a large portion of that likely from Antarctica. But 0.3 to 0.9 um, is a big range. Um, but it's even bigger range if you consider the low likelihood uh, but plausible scenario uh, of 2.7 metres by 2100, and that scenario is entirely about Antarctica and processes that are deeply uncertain uh, in Antarctica. And to put some you know, uh, faces and names to that, that's tens of thousands of Australian homes that are either at high risk or very high risk to coastal inundation, 230 billion of Australian infrastructure uh, are vulnerable to a, a one metre sea level rise. And our Pacific neighbours 
whatever happens in terms of the contribution to sea level from whether it's Antarctica or Greenland, they feel it by about an extra 20% just because of some complicated physics that I won't go into. But uh, the Pacific actually feels the brunt of any um, uh, sea level change. Now, the IPCC projections um, around sea level are, are as good as we can produce, but we are also fully aware that there are deep uncertainties in Antarctica where we know that the knowledge that we have makes us quite concerned about whether those projections are going to be actually what might play out in the future, or if it could be better, or even worse. Uh, there are surprises that keep emerging from Antarctica. We saw some uh, just this year, a 40 degree heat wave in Antarctica. It didn't get to 40 degrees positive, it still stayed below uh, negative in some cases, but 40 degrees, you can imagine a 40 degree heat wave uh, in Australia, 40 degrees warmer than normal, that is. Uh, and we saw the breakup of the Conger Ice Shelf, which didn't have major ramifications for sea level. But these are the surprises we keep on getting caught by, and we need to get ahead of the surprises, and that's part of the work that we're trying to do. So in particular, thinking about sea level, we're, we're trying to fill in the gaps in the map of the things that we don't know. There are large voids um, where, where dragons might be lurking, and we need to uh, get on top of those. Um, we're trying to use data from past warm periods to give some constraints on what the future might look like uh, as well, to rule out unrealistic scenarios. We're, we're trying to test whether the ice shelves, which hold back the ice on the continent, um, whether they'll break up uh, or not, and what, over what timescales they might break up. Uh, and we need to know more about the pathways for the warm ocean water, the ocean that's absorbed 90% of the um, uh, uh, the warmth and how that can get to the, um, to the ice and melt it away in a very efficient way um, uh, and a way that's very bad for us as a society. And Nathan's going to talk a little bit more about uh, the ocean. Thank you for that segue, Matt. I'm, I'm the program leader for the AAPP. And the P is about partnership, and our partners includes the Australian Antarctic Div Division, the C CSIRO, Geoscience Australia, Bureau of Meteorology, IMOS, and UTAS. And so we actually uh, come at the um, funding of the AAPP in a slightly different direction to the two prior speakers. Our mission is a very generic thing, and. Uh, uh, will be reflected in many of the conversations. It's the role of Antarctica in the climate system and on marine ecosystems. So if I take the segue from that, uh, we've seen the extraordinary uh, risks that cannot be ruled out for um, the Antarctic ice sheet and its contribution to sea level going into the future. And the ocean is an important player. Antarctica is not freezing, is, is not melting from above, unlike Greenland, Antarctica is actually melting from below. And it melts from below. 50% of the current melt rate is from uh, the oceans, and that's accelerating, causing the mass loss, contributing to the mass loss around Antarctica. And you saw the risks, the risk in uh, West Antarctica and the emerging risk in the movie that uh, Taz showed in East Antarctica and that's a primary focus of some of our programs to understand that how those warm waters are encroaching into the ice shelf cavities and melting and accelerating the melt rate. But it's not just a story about sea level rise. We sometimes think it's all about sea level rise, or sometimes I do. It's actually also about other things. The ocean um, is an enormous trap for heat coming into uh, the earth. In fact, in the last decade, all of the heating in the planet went into the southern hemisphere, predominantly into the southern ocean, and predominantly actually just north of the Antarctic circumpolar current. If you can remember Taz, Taz's Piccadilly Circus figure, uh, where you saw the Antarctic circumpolar going around, current going around Antarctica, just on the northern side of that, most of that heat is trapped there. So of all that heat, 90% of that was actually trapped in the region just on the northern flank of the ACC. That's an important thing. It saves us, actually, from the uh, disaster that could come from if it got to those ice shelves and the cavity itself. But it's not just about heat, actually. The ocean is an important sink of carbon. 
we uh, currently the oceans are s sinking one third of everything that's emitted by humans, but in the projections that will decline uh, between the terrestrial and uh, oceans, it drops to 38% in high emission scenarios. <clears throat> but it's a little uncertain and we study biological pumps, the processes by which in the sea ice, uh, by the ecosystems underneath the sea ice, in the uptake of carbon by, from the atmosphere, in the biological pumps, you know, the, the not simply just the krill but also the phytoplankton as but drop out into the deep ocean and get sequestered. I don't want to swear in this conversation, so I'm not going to talk about the full detail of that, but these pumps are a critical element of thinking about carbon uptake. We think about the atmosphere, atmospheres as well. Um, the clouds, they're a central problem, actually, to projecting our future climate. So I actually will pose a few questions to uh, you as a kind of a, a, a difference here. We've heard about the Integrated Digital East Antarctica project and the East Antarctic monitoring projects. If you think about those, these are fantastic things. They're really frameworks. So what is it that we should be measuring in East Antarctica? Should we be measuring the warm waters coming onto the shelves? Should we be uh, measuring the thickness of the ice shelves? Should we be understanding the acceleration of them? What is it that we need to actually track that canary in this coal mine, so to speak. It's a terrible pun, sorry. And of course, we've got to make it kind of real time. And so that's another part where the sort of idea framework can work. So we have suddenly on time in this critical decade for actually answering these critical questions around Antarctica. Thank you very much. Mm. Thank you, and very well managed time-wise there, panel. There's an opportunity for a couple of questions that I'll um, deliver. So first of all, hinging off the partnership that um, Nathan was talking about, I'll ask the first question for Nathan and Matt can have a, um, a comment on, and then I'll come to a separate one for Stephen and, and Merrily. So hinging off the partnerships, clearly there's a very strong university and public sector partnership in the science. So, would like your views on how you think that's going, but also on how you think we could leverage best value from that partnership. So, over to Nathan and Matt. Okay, I'll give Matt a chance in a moment. Um, <laughs> the, the partnership's an essential thing. If you think about it, uh, Antarctica requires long-term sustained efforts the Antarctic Division is a conduit and a pathway to basically the only logistics provider to East Antarctica. No one's going to do that from the university sector without getting into trouble. So, so this, that partnership is super clear. But there are new things we can bring to it. Um, PhD students, early career researchers. Uh, we um, have a growing climate community and other paleo communities involved in and related to the research. So the footprint of expertise, logistics, is actually central to solving these problems. And we've, and you can look at the activities of the Antarctic Division and you can see how we augment them from the universities by providing some of the deeper knowledge around modelling, around uh, biogeochemical cycles and so on. And that is actually where we get power. Um, yeah, so, so Nathan's outlined um, uh, uh, some of the differences and opportunities. I, I mean, and to answer Lynn's first question, I think, I think actually the, the footing of the collaboration is as strong as it's been in, uh, I guess, the, the, the 30 years I've been in and around um, Antarctic science between the, uh, the Antarctic Division um, and the university sector. Um, and I'm uh, super excited by the opportunities that that brings. One other area I think that um, uh, you know, w the universities always have a, a struggle doing long-term dedicated studies. In a, everywhere around the world, it's almost impossible to do um, you know, five, 10-year studies, 20-year studies, 30-year studies, and I, I think that's super important for, for governments to be leading that. One of the other areas is, is doing an analysis of where the, I guess, the, the university market fails. 
where over, over a long period of time, the universities are just not investing in particular skill that Australia needs uh, for its national capability um, and, uh, and may never do. Uh, and, and yet, and I can think of examples where, where Australia is sort of exposed um, in, at, at some times. Um, and so there's an opportunity to partner together to go, actually, who's going to do this piece of work? Because someone has to do it. And I think that collaboration and that discussion is going on and it's super exciting as part of this decadal planning process. Thank you. Thanks, Nathan and Matt. I'll now turn to um, Stephen and Narrowly for another slightly different tangent to the questions, but still based on this really important partnership um, and well invested in partnership with a view that it delivers and, and is science for societal certainty, going back to our theme. So the question for you is, for many Australians, Antarctica seems a long way away. Um, and I know it's not just science for Australia, it's science in terms of um, societal certainty and the issues that the world and challenges the world faces. But how do you think and what opportunities do you think there are for making the science that we're doing more relevant to um, the community? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to start also by answering one of Nathan's questions, and that is if he comes over to the SAFE SRI and speaks to our folk who are working in value of information theory, then answering that question of what to measure in real time will be answered fairly straightforwardly, though implementing it will be much more difficult. In response to the question, I think there are a few things that we could do. The one is to actually make the messaging fairly straightforward for society. And some of those messages are already resonating in social media. So, for example, what happens in Antarctica does not stay in Antarctica, and then a small sea, sea level segue. Or <clears throat> Antarctica is like no place on Earth, which, of course, it isn't in places because there are, in fact, places in Antarctica where there is no life. Microbiologists have looked, and there's no life. And that's, of course, just quite similar to the rest of the social... The, the solar system. There are other messages where you can say that Antarctica is coming to a postcode near you. And that's not necessarily sea level. That's work actually that narrowly is done, showing that the southeastern fires, the huge intensity, is influenced by the southern annular mode, which in turn is a climate system that may intensify the extent to which we see large extensive fires. So Antarctica is influencing everything around you. And I think with those really straightforward messages, including, for example, unhappy feet, I mean, that sort of resonates really well, that, that we can start having society involved and then transfer the messages. I, I do think that when we think about our, our work, words to society, it's not only for the policymakers, but in fact it's for the people that the policymakers are responsible for and who elected them. And I think if we get that message right, then we'll be speaking to all of our audiences as scientists. And in a global setting, Australia's proving to be really good at doing this in the treaty system, uh, in the Kamala setting, and in other international agreements where we are, in fact, working for the benefit of society. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, so, so I think that we, we have... Um, we have a lot of strengths when we're thinking about how we communicate about Antarctic science. And the first one, of course, is that Antarctica is just an astounding place. And I'm sure I don't have to convince anybody in the room of that, that fact. So I think it, it does make our, our job of communicating the changes and the importance of Antarctica um, a lot easier than for, for some areas. But I think one of the, the major challenges that, that we face is that some of these changes in the way that Antarctica will affect us in the future um, when we talk about, for example, sea level rise, we start having to talk about 2300 and 2500 in terms of when those major impacts are actually going to be realised. And so, so that is a challenge in terms of how do we convey the message that actually it's the decisions that we're making right now in this decade that actually set those things into motion. So I think that we, we have a role 
in terms of working together as a community to, to come up with the, the way that we tell that story in a way that resonates um, with the people so that we can make sure that the policy decisions that we need to happen this decade to stop those worst case scenarios are actually put in place and that we're playing the role internationally to make sure that we bring the global community along with making those changes as well. Um, and I think the, the other aspect where particularly the universities have a role to play is through that cha um, training of the next generation of scientists, but also just the next generation of the workforce in particular. And I think increasing, increasingly we're going to see that climate change is impacting every aspect of society and certainly we're already seeing it in the university sector that we can't train climate scientists fast enough to meet up with the demand for the jobs that are out there um, and that's something that I think is a, is a continuation that increasingly all areas of our um, businesses and economy and communities are actually going to need this climate science information um, and how that relates to Antarctica. So I think the, the universities have an important role to play there in getting that message out to the people that we're training as well. Thank you very much. So thank you, Stephen and Nerily, and some terrific insights there. I like the idea of uh, Antarctica like no place on, uh, uh, on Earth and a great opportunity to... Uh, ensure that there's that relevance, connection and um, ability to, to translate it. So we are now um, at time for our um, session. So I think we must um, conclude at this point. And can I just say, and if we could ask for a round of applause for our speakers, Nerily, Stephen, um, Matt and Nathan, thank you very much.